one to ten, on a scale of one to ten, how much flack have you gotten since Trump got elected? Because before, when you were predicting the Trump thing, it was a, it was a dumpster fire, your Twitter feed. <laughs> and then afterwards, I would imagine there's some sense of, of, okay, you were right, but most of that's probably more like, F you, I don't care that you were right. Well, a tremendous amount of the Twitter traffic were apparently professional trolls because the moment he got elected, they just all went away. And really? it, it seems like they, they would have stayed around a little bit if they were just normal people to say, well, we'll see what you've done and that sort of thing. But yeah, I would say it went down 80% after election, at least on Twitter. Really? But in terms of the impact on my life, I would say my, my uh, number of friends is probably down 75%. That's a <laughs> so, lot. Since I started run it, writing about it. So that you're down to one friend now. I just, <laughs> just one friend and, and, and he's, on the, uh, he's on the watch list right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. So I've noticed that a lot of people have, have mentioned that they've lost friends because of the, the, pol the political situation. And I think that's kind of a shame. I've got plenty of friends on both sides of the camp. They're, they're probably not people I would want to have over at the same time, all of them. Some of them would be totally fine. There's only a few in each camp that I think are completely insufferable when they start talking about politics. And this has been a particularly divisive election, particularly divisive administration in general. And one thing that your book, When Bigly, focuses on is the persuasion aspect of the current administration, or of Donald Trump specifically. But during this show, I would love, if possible, it probably isn't, but I'm gonna try anyway, to divorce the persuasion concepts from the, the man himself, because I don't want people to go, this is about Trump, click, right? I want people to go, okay, maybe I hate Trump or maybe I love him, but in the meantime, I'm gonna learn something about persuasion. I don't know how feasible that is. I think we've already triggered a lot of people just by <laughs> yeah. mentioning this. But uh, for the rest of the people who are actually still listening, I think we might be able to learn something. Because I learned something, I learned a lot from the book, devoured it in one plane ride, and went away thinking, okay, I'm not really qualified to say whether this is all accurate or not, but it's certainly interesting. Um, yeah, we can do that. Let's. Let's, uh, Let's proceed. Try I'll, yeah, I'll, sure. I'll try to detrump it as much as possible. Yeah, it might be tricky. You did mention your career and your income took a huge gap. It's, I don't know if it's a gap, but a, what's a proper term for this? Nosedive, maybe? Took a hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah severe hit. What, what now? I guess now you write a book and then you try to make up for the, the little stop loss here. Yeah, I don't think the book will make up for the no. uh, the annihilation of my speaking career. Uh, I lost a big corporate uh, license deal and probably will never get another licensing deal for Dilbert going forward. Because of that? Because of writing about uh, the election, yes. So because it, poor Dilbert. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's an innocent cartoon and now he's going to be... Well, so far the comic itself is fine because newspapers are a little bit immune to the, you know, left-right battle. They, they try to serve both. So, mm -hmm. so I'm fine in newspapers, but that's, that's the only solid place. Really? That seems, it seems strange to me that someone would go, hey, we were going to put your cartoon on a mug, but now we just can't do it because it reminds us too much of, of the president. Yeah, there's some people who just can't shake that association. Wow. Yikes. Well, I guess if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? Would you, uh, would you do it exactly as you had, or would you maybe sell the Dilbert stuff to a, a, a trust or something like that, or move some IP around, or maybe you'd be Adam Scott on Twitter instead of Scott Adams? <laughs> you know, I think I'm actually a, attracted to trouble. You know, it's, it's been a, <laughs> okay. a, sort of a lifetime problem with me. You know, I think, well, what's the most dangerous thing I could do? And then I think, well, that sounds good. You know, usually I talk myself out of it. In this case, I probably would have talked myself into it again because I, I did enjoy, uh, I guess, the, the fight of it, you know, the intellectual fight of it. But there was something bigger I thought happening during the election. I, I thought that it would change how people thought about uh, their place in the world. To me, it seemed like a, a far bigger thing than just, you know, one person's persuasion. Sure, because when I think dangerous, I think cartoonist. <laughs> right. so. Well, you know, cartoonists do get killed. That's true. It, oh, actually, you know what? That's very true, especially in the last few years. Yeah, the it? Charlie Hebdo guys. Yeah, that, and the, the what was the other one? The Draw Muhammad contest? The, the film? I guess he was. A, was that a filmmaker? Filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, adjacent artists in general. Now yeah. it's not as safe as it as it was before. 
you say that you're in no political camp and you're more of an observer, and that's fair. It's hard to say that when you read the book because it is about one side's, it is about the president's persuasive power. Uh, and so a lot of folks might really not believe that. But to those folks, I kind of want to say it doesn't really matter whether or not that's true, in my opinion. I think looking at persuasion as a skill set, it kind of doesn't matter who we're learning from if that person is effective. I think it would be, there's probably no persuasion class anywhere, rhetoric class especially, anywhere on the planet that doesn't say, all right, we don't condone this, but here's a bunch of Hitler speeches, and these were <laughs> undoubtedly effective for negative results. And I think to omit that kind of case study is to just kind of plug our ears and sing la 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 and hope that it goes away. Yeah, unfortunately, there are effective people that we don't like. Mm -hmm. And if you're just looking at the tools and you can hold your nose and say, what do I, what can I learn? Then you can learn. You mentioned that when you're a member of a group, you'll find their views more sympathetic. So of course, I have to ask you, is the book then a reflection of, well, you know, secretly I am a Trump supporter, so of course all of these things look like persuasion because they worked on me. <laughs> well, I, I describe myself politically as left to Bernie, except with a preference for the things that might actually work. Mm -hmm. In other words, philosophically, I want, you know, free education, free health care, and all those things. I don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe America could, you know, at least have a, a plan to get there eventually. So politically, I'm not on the uh, Republican side. But in terms of the first word you used was, you know, in their camp. But as soon as you said that, I thought to myself, well, I am sort of in their camp because I do represent a point of view which they like. And I do, um, I do appreciate that group because they're, they're the ones who supported me for two years, whereas the other group attacked me viciously for two years. So I have a strong preference for the people, which is different than the policies or the politician. It seems strange to me, and I, I know how I started with, let's not talk about Trump, and now I've only done that, but I promise at one point I will you're, abandon you're that. You're not the first person who couldn't avoid it. <laughs> I know, I know, right? It's like there's this huge magnetic force. It really, it really is, and we'll talk about that in a, a little bit as well. I think that it is interesting that we find that when someone strongly disagrees with a certain side's perspectives, they then start to disagree, and this goes for any person, this is not just from this election or just pro or anti-Trump, people then go, I don't like that you're even saying that this is a possibility, therefore I'm going to attack you. Because it seemed to me always a little bit nonsensical to come after somebody who says, I'm predicting a Trump win for better or for worse. Or somebody who's, who also maybe in Silicon Valley would say things like, don't keep talking about Trump, you're going to get him elected. Nobody went to that guy and said, you shut up, we'll talk about whatever we want. They all went, oh, okay, that's a good idea. And I had the same problem on this show when I interviewed Roger Stone. People went, I, I'm unsubscribing because he shouldn't be allowed to talk. And I thought, who made these decisions about who I'm allowed to talk to or about? And I think that's a weird problem that you have faced more than anybody. Well, let me bail you out. Let's talk about uh, Colin Kaepernick's persuasion because I'm a big Kaepernick fan. There we go. So when I say fan, it has nothing to do with football. It doesn't even have anything to do with the, the specific policies he's pushing, although that topic is important, of course. But persuasion-wise, Colin Kaepernick nailed it. I mean, he did, he, he uh, raised consciousness. The entire country is talking about, you know, the, the, the thing that he started. He stayed within the law. He didn't break any laws. He offended our sensibilities in exactly the right way for a protest, mm -hmm. right? And now my, my image of the America that I want to live in is that, you know, I don't want a flag that I'm not allowed to burn, right? Like that's not a flag that has the same value to me. I'm offended when somebody burns it because it's just an emotional reaction. Right. But I don't want to live in a country that has a flag I can't burn, right? right. And so Colin Kaepernick, I think persuasion-wise, I mean, it's like the Nobel Prize of persuasion. The entire country is talking about his thing. He broke no law. He hurt no people. And, and he had skin in the game. That's as good as it gets. Yeah, that's true, right? He's not in jail. He doesn't have any, well, I don't know if he got a fine from the owners. It's hard to say. But if he did, it's going to be a drop in the bucket compared to whatever next contract he's going to end up with or the one he already has. And well, he doesn't have a contract now, so oh, that's does he? a problem. Oh, well, yeah. I guess I don't know. It's, yeah. I, I would say that that shows you, one, how much I follow sports versus <laughs> other items on the agenda. But I don't think he's going to be suffering for this any more than 
Well, I don't know. Actually, what do you think is going to happen in this situation? You're pretty good at predicting things I think so you far. I think you suffered quite a bit. I mean, you know, the huge portion of the country will never forgive him. Oh, that's true. Um, and that and it just will never go away. I don't think there's anything he can do to fix that. And well, he's, he's good. So I, I've just gave him, you know, big props for persuasion. So maybe he has more game than we know. But at this moment, I'd say he, he put his skin in the game for something he cared about. And it's going to cost him yeah. like, forever, probably. Do you think that it's politically, and I mean that in the broadest sense of the, the word, beneficial to then alienate certain people like he has done while then, of course, using that same platform to draw many, many people that much closer to him? For example, I didn't care about this at all. He was a name on a jersey and nothing more. Now he's been elevated a few tiers up as, a, as somebody who's an influencer in a way that actually matters. Yeah. There are plenty of people who say, I'm not watching football anymore and screw this guy. It's almost a worthwhile trade-off in my opinion, but I'm wondering what you think about that sort of thing. Well, it, it's certainly worthwhile in the sense that he raised the issue that he wanted to raise and he, and he, he took the bullet. I mean, he knew that this was going to cost him, and he did it anyway. So that I have to respect. Is that where you kind of fell on the, the Trump prediction scale as well? Because it sounds... It sounds easy to say, and that's why I wrote about Trump on my blog. And it's like, people are going to go, this guy wrote about Trump on a blog, the other guy took a knee in front of the whole country. It's not the same thing. Well, no, I would, certainly would never compare myself <laughs> to any of those individuals. Uh, I, I took some risk with what I was doing. But I, I did think, and I still think, that if you look at the way people talk about um, the election, the word persuasion is now common. You know, you didn't see that in other in other elections. Um, you see people referring to um, a, a phrase that I'm I'm credited online for being the first to say, which is this 3D, 4D chess uh, mm -hmm. analogy. So it's become common to think that the way the president operates is through a persuasion filter, and he's got some technique there. And it's not just all random, and that's what I wanted people to know. I wanted to sort of. Uh, it wasn't about Trump so much as, you know, opening a hole in the universe to look through to a, a deeper truth. And the, the main thing I always talk about is the two movies on one screen, the, the number of times we're looking at exactly the same information. There's no data difference. We're smart, we're looking at it, and we just come to different conclusions. I was just uh, reading Scientific America on the plane the other day, and they had a fascinating study where they were trying to figure out, you know, what's up with these science deniers? Oh, please, okay. yeah. What, so, tell me about that. I would so, love to hear about that. So number one, I don't believe there's any such thing as a science denier, right? I've never met anybody who thought science was a bad idea. <laughs> there are people who looked at the same stuff and came to different conclusions. And if you don't like the conclusion that they came to, doesn't agree with the majority, you got a problem. But here's a study in Scientific America that, that tells you the two movies on one screen uh, vividly. They wanted to find out if denying science had something to do with simply not understanding science. So you would, the first thing you would test is, well, is it just the dumb people? And sure enough, they would find that there were plenty of dumb people who disagreed with the scientists. But they also found that uh, across the entire knowledge scale, to the most knowledgeable about science, no facts changed their minds. <laughs> in, other, in other words, the data was never part of the decision to begin with. So the, the fact that some people are saying no and some people are saying yes, is almost certainly because they align with the political side, you know, at least in most cases, mm -hmm. there have to be some independent minds there somewhere. But in general, people just vote their side and then they figure out why they did it after the fact. I could not agree more. When we had Shaquille O'Neal on the show, he mentioned that he was just joking when he said that the earth was flat. And I got a lot of email, mostly tweets, because you know how they go on Twitter, right. saying, no, 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 the earth really is flat. It's a, this is the Freemasons are forcing him to say that he was joking because <laughs> this, that, and the other thing. And every single person that I engaged with, because I was genuinely curious, there are really flat earthers out there. I want to know what these people are about. Yeah. Universally, they were religious, and they were part of a certain church that said the earth is flat, and there's the firmament, and that's what the angels ab live above that. and then all of the other, and I throw this in air quotes, science, then somehow has to be squeezed into that, that sort of perspective. And that sort of perspective says, no, above the sky is the firmament, and above the firmament is heaven, 
everything else has to fall into that. And that means the earth has to be flat. Well, I think I found my new religion because I like to keep it simple. Yeah, there you go. Earth is flat, angels up there, done. Yeah, angels up there, bad stuff down there. <laughs> Just don't dig too far and we're good to go. Yeah. Tell me about, and I'd love to hear about 3D and 4D chess as a result of this conversation as well. So don't let me forget about that. But let's talk about the types of persuader. You go through that early in the book, Win Bigly. What are the different types of persuaders? What are we dealing with on a daily basis? So I try to help people figure out the, the different powers that different persuaders have. And so uh, it, it seemed to me that uh, I'm what I call a commercial persuader. And by that I mean um, I use persuasion for my job. It's part of how I write. It's part of how I make cartoons. It's part of how I write books. And so I'm a commercial grade persuader. Um, Above me would be uh, cognitive scientists, people who actually study this for a living. So I, as I say in Win Bigley, if a cognitive scientist says, hey, this chapter is wrong, believe the scientist, not me. You know, I'm commercial grade, they're, they're science grade. Um, and then above that, um, I put the, what I call the master persuaders. These are people who have all the tools of persuasion, but they bring something else, they either a high risk appetite, or there's something about their personality that's just gigantic. In the case, in this case, uh, Trump has both. So there are people like Steve Jobs, for example, where there's something about his willpower, his, again, appetite for risk, uh, and, and other things that just normal people don't have. But they're above and beyond the tools of persuasion. But you put them together and they're, they're insanely powerful. So the things that we see master persuaders do are maybe not yet explained by science then? Is that what you're saying? Or are there things that scientists have not studied since they're a rung above on the ladder? Oh, I, I, here, let me give you some examples. Sure. That'd be better than that. Yeah. So, no, I don't think it's uh, so much a case that science hasn't discovered what master persuaders can do. Um, I, I'm just, let, an example would be a master persuader says something that uh, they know is not true and they're gonna take a lot of flack for it. But in the meantime, every, they're gonna get attention for something that they want attention for. Ordinary people can't do that because they say, oh, I'm not going to go in public and say something that I know isn't true. But a master persuader, sometimes they say, well, you know, it's for a, a greater good, perhaps, we hope, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll shade this. I'll use a little hyperbole. It doesn't really matter in the long run. What, what matters is where we're heading, and I think that's a good place to go. So uh, there's something about the personality that's able to do what other people would say, I just can't do that. Right, so it's almost, a, like you said, a high appetite for risk and or something that makes them almost immune to the social consequences or ignorant <laughs> in a way that makes them just not care at all. Yeah, immune to shame is, yes. is a big deal. Yeah. So if you look at my arc, um, you know, transitioning from cartoonist to guy who was writing about persuasion and stuff, that was a risky transition. And we see the risk and all the friction it caused, all the, all, you know, the cost to my main business, the, you know, the attacks that I got online and everything. But I'm at a point in my life where I like the risk and I'm not, I, I'm almost immune to shame. I, you know, it's, it's sort of a learned behavior. <laughs> you know, I've, we'll see about that when yeah, it comes out. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> it's still early. Um, but the, it is a learned skill to be immune to other people's opinions and just sort of brush it off and, and move on. Well, let's talk about that. How do we learn that skill? Because there are plenty of people that have nothing to be ashamed of, but do have unpopular views that would love to know how they make that happen. Um, number one way is to be embarrassed a whole bunch of times and then look back a month later and say, oh, my day today is exactly like it would have been if that had never happened. Right, the yeah. real life consequences were yeah. I was embarrassed temporarily yeah. and nothing more. Yeah, I, I took the Dale Carnegie course. I may have mentioned that last time we talked. But a small part of the course is they actually have you embarrass yourself intentionally in front of the class. I don't remember that, and I've taken a lot of Dale Carnegie. <laughs> maybe they rewrote the curriculum after at a, at a certain point. <laughs> maybe, maybe nobody would take it after that yeah. point. Um, but I found that really, really helpful. And it even, it even helps with things like public speaking because you're, you're thinking, oh, what's everybody thinking of me? And the Dale Carnegie course just lets you just let go and just act natural. And that's the safest thing you can do. So it's the worrying that causes the problem. You know, you, you think, well, I'd better worry about this because this is a potential problem. But the only problem was the worrying. Once you get rid of that, it solves itself. So essentially we can go back and maybe journal sometimes where we felt really embarrassed and then examine 
the lasting consequences thereof and find that there really aren't any? Well, yeah, it's an ongoing process. And one of the things I've got going for me is that I'm old, right? Yeah, huh, I'm, yeah. so, so I'm 60. I so, didn't notice. So the, the number of times that you've been embarrassed presumably is far fewer than the number of times you, I have. You'd be surprised, but yeah, <laughs> maybe that's true, yeah. Uh, especially recently, you've been racking them up, I see, online, I think, um, whether, you, whether you've done so intentionally or not. And I think a lot of people have it out for you, and this is probably not going to help. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I think my popularity will plunge to an old, you know, a new low. Um, but with books, books are not really sold to people who want to learn something. Um, well, let me, let me modify that <laughs> a little bit. <clears throat> people buy books to hear their own opinion expressed better. All right, at least political books. Right. Now, this particular book, my book, has you know, information in it about persuasion, so, uh, but still people are going to say, well, you know, you're talking about this topic and I'm on the other side, so I'm not even going to listen to the persuasion. So what I expect is it will be a polarizing book, but it may not be bad for sales because you're better off exciting a small group of people who actually act than to be uh, pretty good to a bunch of people. You know, that's, that's the Hollywood model. The Hollywood model is if you're testing a, a pilot for a show and everybody who's in the, the test audience says, yeah, that's good. I, I'd watch that show. That's pretty good. That means nothing. Mm -hmm. All right? You want 10% of those people to walk out and say, good Lord, this is the best show I've ever seen. You know, tell me when this is on. Can I get a copy of the tape? You know, so, you, so you need excitement from a small number that predicts success better than a lot of people saying, yeah, that's pretty good. So this book will, and, and I can back you up on this, this will certainly polarize a lot of people. I think people who support the current administration are going to go, yeah, this is amazing. I never noticed all this stuff. It's so enlightening. Now i got to go rewatch all this video. I'm going to be looking at him differently. And I will say that even now, having read this and not necessarily by any stretch falling into one of the mainstream political camps, that it's become at least, and I'll, I'll give you this, it's become very much, a lot more interesting to watch the president speak because now I can look for the persuasion things instead of just saying, oh, what sweet, what fresh hell is this now with the climate thing or whatever. Uh, and I wish that we had a book about this for pretty much anybody that we had to, to watch that we didn't necessarily like uh, for, for the next several period, uh, for the next period of several years. And I will say also that the examples in the book they're going to ruffle some feathers, and I can see your review in, I think some of your best media that's going to sell a lot of this book are going to be people that just skewer the crap out of it, uh, whether they do a good job at that or not. I think you're going to have a lot of rebuttal pieces from some of those reviews online, that you, and you should just warm up that keyboard and have a replacement ready, because you're going to be doing a lot of typing, I think. It's going to be really challenging for yeah. reviewers, I think. I think they're going to have a tough time for it, with the, for the same reason the public will. They're going to try to separate the politics and their view of things from the, the actual book. Um, I, I'm going on um, the Morning Joe show when I do my, <laughs> my uh Wow, my you're just, they're starting at an expert level. I'm going, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, going into the lion's den. I, I can't wait. That'll be fun. Yeah, that should be interesting. I, I often wonder, though, how many journalists that interview you read the stuff that you put out before they do the interview or if they just get five bullet points from an intern and then try to wing it. Well, in the case of a book, it's actually rare for somebody to read the book. So you're, you're actually in rare territory having mm. consumed it before I got here. Um, I would say no more than one in eight or ten, maybe. It seems like that would be a huge advantage if you want to debate somebody about a book that they've written, that you might want to <laughs> go ahead and read it first, or at least part of it. Well, it certainly gives me some freedom. Yeah. It's like, as I said in the book, Bo, you wouldn't know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, all right, people don't use facts to make decisions. That was one of the major points in the book. Tell us why that's true, because a lot of people go, nope, all my decisions are fact-based, and I am empirical, and that's what's good about my decisions, is they're all based on fact. Yeah, everybody thinks that, mm -hmm. um, but the, I think there was, a, there was a recent study, I wish I could quote it, but something like 98% you know, 90, of people just won't change no matter what facts you give them on politics. People will change on things they don't care about. Right? Hmm. So, so if you were to imagine this on the graph, the more they cared about it, the less likely they're going to change, which seems backwards, right? You know, the, the, right. the more emotion that they have into it, I guess that's the better way to say it. The more emotion, the more likely their, their mental processes are short-circuited. Right, because of all the fallacies, confirmation bias, sunk cost fallacy, there's a lot of emotional investment in anything that you are 
I'm, I'm trying not to say there's a lot of emotional investment in things that you're emotionally invested in, because that's <laughs> circular, but things that you feel strongly about, by definition, you're investing more and more emotion in that, which would make you more and more wrong in the past if you change your mind moving forward, which is why we see as remarkable people who do things like leave the Amish and join the, the, the what the, what do we call it? I guess the, the real world, I, I, don't, I would say, <laughs> the rest of the world. We find that amazing. Or somebody that shakes off severe issues growing up in the middle of rural Africa or something like that and becomes some sort of tech entrepreneur. Those stories are amazing because of the amount of investment that somebody has uh, in a certain way of life or a certain certain set of thoughts, religion or otherwise. Let, let me give you a little example that was uh, that's a, a current one. So after the Vegas shooting, there's lots of talk about the the security guard um, Jesus Campos and you know right. where was he and you know and a lot of people came up with conspiracy theories and they were so sure their conspiracy theory was right that this security guard must have been somehow connected with the shooter that when they produced the the actual picture of him and then people compared it to, I guess, an older picture, which they knew was actually him. And they said, they, they put him side by side on Twitter, and they said, clearly not the same guy. Hmm. They, they've replaced him with a body double. And I looked at the pictures, and I'm not, I don't buy into the conspiracy theories, and therefore I have no emotional investment. I simply you know, didn't think that was a thing. I look at those pictures, and I think, that's exactly the same guy. Mm -hmm. It could not be more obvious. I'm looking at him like two pictures next to each other, clearly the same guy. But other people, honest, smart, completely normal people who can hold jobs, looked at those pictures and said, oh my God, this one on the left is a whole different person. And when you see it that starkly, you're actually standing in the room with somebody who's looking at the same simple thing and they're seeing it differently. It's amazing. It just, it just tells you how powerful this is. And that was only with just a little bit of um, you know, mental investment in their prior opinion. And, and they still couldn't shake it. With a photograph that could not have been clearer, in my opinion. Do you think we're evolved to see that way? We actually had a brain scientist on the show earlier, and I can't remember which brain scientist it was, but she was saying that one of the things they're studying right now are a lot of these police shootings. And they're thinking that the police are actually seeing dangerous weapons because their brain is painting a completely different picture. And she thinks that with more advanced brain imaging in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to be able to see that people who make grave mistakes like that based on negative stereotypes, maybe of the race or ethnicity of the person that they're, they're involved with, they're actually seeing something completely different than we're seeing on a video, mm -hmm. which is why it looks so bad on the video. Because we look and we say, how did you think that guy was armed and running towards you when he was unarmed and running away from you? And if we one day get to the day where we can replay what they saw in their brain, somehow we'll see exactly what they said, which is he was running towards me and he had a gun in his hand. You've probably seen the famous video of the people passing a ball around and then the then the monkey joins the, the circle. Well, yeah, this guy in a gorilla suit yeah. or something walks <laughs> by slowly. Uh, he actually joins the circle for a moment. Oh, really? And, and because you've been asked to count the number of passes that they pass back and forth, people don't see a man in a gorilla suit joining a small group of, I don't know, five people in a, in, in a circle. And after they tell you, and then you watch it, you think, I was blind to a giant monkey on screen and I didn't even see it. I thought it was a fake video where it played twice and one had the, the bear or the monkey or the gorilla, whatever it was, and one didn't. So I actually rewound it and rewatched it. And then I reloaded it from an incognito tab in Chrome thinking, oh, it knows that I'm back because there's no way that I missed this. And we can link to that video in the show notes for people that haven't run this test on themselves. You will be shocked. Well, I guess we've ruined it now, right? But show a friend who's not looking for that, because right. now, of course, you, you'll say, how did you miss this, you knuckleheads? If you show it to somebody who's not aware of what the test is testing, you will find that they miss it 100, almost 100% of the time. So uh, stop me if I've told this story before, the last time we talked, but um, I was once a bank teller uh, here in San Francisco, and I got robbed at gunpoint. And during the middle of the day? During the middle of the day. So it was a bank robbery? Bank robbery. Yeah. Wow. Which actually is very common. The, most of the local branches get robbed on a regular basis, but you don't even know it if you're in the lobby of the bank. It's usually just a quiet transaction. You know, give me your money. They do. The guy leaves. Anyway, so I, I, I got robbed twice at gunpoint when I was a bank teller when I was uh, in my 20s. Oh, my God. And, uh, of course, the FBI and police or whoever it is comes by they, and they say, give us the description. So I described him, and keep in mind that he was, he was right in front of me. 
he was at my window, the bank teller window, and I had a good look at him, right? And I said, oh, yeah, he's, a, he's about my size, you know, he's about 5'8", and yeah, he, he's, uh, you know, had uh, salt and pepper hair, and he was sort of bald, and, you know, he hadn't shaved for a while, and he had a long trench coat. And I had a really good image. In fact, I, I still have it in my head, a perfect image of, of that guy. So I get a call from my boss, and he goes, they're wondering if you really uh, pulled the secret alarm, which activates the camera, it tells you where the camera is supposed to be looking, you know, at what point they're supposed to be looking. And they said they can't find that guy on the video when they play it back. So I actually went to the top secret FBI headquarters, <laughs> you know, it wasn't headquarters, but the place that they look at the tapes, and they said, uh, you know, is this guy in the tape the guy who robbed you? And I said, no, that's not even close. The guy in the tape was, he looked like 35, like a young Clint Eastwood with this big bushy brown mustache, full head of hair, and a sport jacket. Could not have been further from the guy that I clearly saw. And uh, then they, they played it backwards in slow motion, and I watched that complete stranger rob me. <laughs> Right. So there was no ambiguity when you saw it on tape. He actually was robbing me. Um, but my memory was an entirely different person. And, you know, the FBI said, yeah, don't even worry about it. That's actually kind of normal. Who did you think that robbed you? I mean, did you pick that guy out of a movie? Was it just somewhere stored in the, in the memory banks from a TV show you saw as a kid? Who knows? Because, you know, you're under duress and then your brain just doesn't act normally, and right. then you convince yourself you saw something you didn't see. Right, but when you're trying to theoretically fight or flight, fight for your life, it's not going, your brain's not saying, it's gonna be important for you to remember exactly <laughs> what this person looks like for later. Your brain's thinking, how do I get out of here without getting shot in the head by this crazy person? And then there was a second one, second time I got robbed, he actually put the, the, the gun up to my nose. So I actually took out a gun and, and held it right up to my face and said he would you know, shoot me if I didn't give him money, which is really scary because you're pulling the silent alarm while you're looking down the barrel of the gun. Right. And he knows it. <laughs> it's, right. a it's a really scary situation. Uh, and I, I was dumb to have even pulled the alarm. I should have just you know, given him my own wallet and said, hey, take what you can. Um, but I gave him the money, and uh, eventually I got asked to be part of a lineup, picking a guy out of a lineup. And I recognized him immediately, but he was also the only one smiling. And so, and, and the other people in the room, because he'd robbed several banks, and right. there were several witnesses, we all picked the same guy. And I always wondered after that day, was it because he was the only one smiling? Huh, he, so he, he just stood out, you didn't necessarily pick him. He was going out of his way to look like he wasn't worried. And the, the others were actors, so they were looking, they were trying to act like a guilty guy, and he's the only one who wasn't. So I always wondered, did I really recognize him? Or did, did that cue me that he must be the guy? Oh, interesting. Look wrong? I'll yeah. never know. So if you're in a lineup, try to just look like everybody else in the lineup. Don't try to look like you're relaxed. Uh, I'm hoping to avoid that lineup situation. Yeah. <laughs> right. So why is this concept important that humans use emotion instead of facts to make decisions? What, is this, what impact does this have on us? This is a, a concept we teach at our boot camps and our live programs quite a bit, but I'm curious as to what you would say about this. So I call this the, the hypnotist point of view. So I'm a trained hypnotist. And one of the things that you sort of have to believe in order to even do hypnosis and understand it and, and work with it is that people are irrational about 90% of the time. 10% of the time on the little stuff they don't care about, they can do fine. But the common view of the world is exactly the opposite of that. The common view is that we're we are rational 90% of the time, and about 10% of the time we get emotional and things go crazy. If you use those two filters on life, and say, okay, which one is explaining things better? The irrational filter just wins every time, all right? That doesn't mean it's true, because we may live in a universe where we're just fooled about everything, who knows? But certainly as a filter to predict things, it's very true. Um, it, just look at the fact that two people can look at the same data with the same IQ, same backgrounds, and just see different things. Actually, literally see different things, like we were just talking. That's completely irrational behavior, and it's, it's the norm, it's not the exception. One of the concepts in Win Bigly is that things we think about all the time rise a couple of rungs up on the ladder of importance in our minds. You gave a lot of really interesting examples of this and the way that Trump uses these examples to persuade. Can we explain and give some examples of this? Because that explains a lot of why a lot of these facts and assertions and things like that come out of his mouth seemingly for no reason 
and a lot of us just smack our foreheads and think, you didn't Google this before you got up on a podium in front of the media? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll quote uh, Dr. Carmen Simon, expert on memory. She's been on the show, yeah. Uh, and um, she teaches and writes about the fact that if you don't have a little bit of wrongness, people won't remember it. So if everything looks the same, you, your brain just falls asleep and says, yeah, blah, 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 more of that. Because your brain can't remember everything, right? It, it's very selective. And so there's something about President Trump's natural style, which I think he has intentionally elevated for, for these purposes, that everything seems to violate something that you didn't think should have been violated. He either acts in a way that you say, no president should act that way, or he states something that you think that couldn't possibly be true, um, or he, he uses a word that shouldn't be used in that context. There's just something about it that's not normal. And he does that so consistently, it would be hard to think that that's completely accidental. Um, although I do imagine there are plenty of times where there's a small error and he just doesn't care. Mm -hmm. like, you know, the, so some of it is not caring to make it exactly as how people expect. But the net effect of it is, you can't turn away. You know, you, if you tweet something, you just say, oh, that's more interesting than whatever else I was doing. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes part of your brain's architecture. How can we use this concept in our own lives if we're not the president of the free world here? What do we do in, in our daily lives to, to maybe capitalize on the fact that, look, I want people to think this is important. How do I get it wrong, but not so wrong I lose credibility? Well, there, there's probably there must be infinite ways to do something slightly wrong. Sure. So I guess it would depend on the specific situation. But um, if you're using hyperbole, and let's say, uh, let's use the classic example, let's say, uh, well, for example, in this interview, um, I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, at least 50 or 60 people have showed up in the audience to watch us. Sure. And I'm, I'm really happy about million, that. Million, million and a half, yeah. Now, now when, if that ever gets fact-checked and we find out it's two, <laughs> and they're uh, both my parents. Yeah, <laughs> that would never. That would be. It's a little too far fetched. Who's going to believe that yeah. anyway? Um, but, but by the time somebody finds out that that fact was an exaggeration, they still have it in their head, and they've lived with. Well, I guess there were a lot of people at that thing, and even the corrected information just doesn't have as much in, impact as the original thought. We don't like to change our mind that much. So we can always use hyperbole, and then just realize because people think, why would he say that? Of course he's going to get caught on that, and what you're saying is, yeah, but it doesn't matter if he gets caught on that because the effect happens in the moment. It doesn't matter that later on down the line, it doesn't look accurate. Well, he also uses the trick where he makes you, uh, you know, think past the sale uh, quite a bit. So uh, there was a recent tweet where he, he said something like, uh, I can't imagine the Democrats, if they voted against this, you know, how would they live with themselves in the future? And, and it makes you think about, well, could they live with themselves? You know, what, how, would that be hard in the future? What, what would that be like if you didn't vote for this? What, you know, and that seems like an exaggeration. I think those Democrats would be fine because it's the way they voted. I'm sure they liked it. So you're talking to yourself about this future where they've got a problem, you know, and you've already thought past, you know, did they, did they make that vote? So he's, he's making them think about their bad future, mm -hmm. uh, which is strong persuasion. What types of things can we learn from cognitive dissonance? This is one of the things that you start the book with. It's a concept we discuss a lot on the show. Can we define it and then talk about what makes, why it makes us irrational? So the, 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 the Scott's definition of cognitive dissonance, you know, uh, without all the science in it, is that if there's something that violates your uh, expectations or your self-image or just the way you think the world is supposed to be, especially if it involves you, right? That, that's the biggest trigger. If, if there's something about you that you would have to change. For example, if you found yourself doing something stupid, but you believe you're a very smart person, instead of saying, well, I guess I was wrong. I must be stupid after all. You would, it's far more likely you'd say, well, I had a good reason in this particular case. I didn't get sleep or whatever it was. Well, in that case, that might actually be the reason. Hmm. So terrible example. But the point is that we spontaneously come up with a reason why everything was, was fine and our original opinion you know, was just great. So essentially, we rationalize past opinions or behaviors in order to make them line up with the pre-existing beliefs. Yeah, but, and, but rationalizing is almost too weak. 
because cognitive dissonance can give you a full-blown hallucination in which you're seeing stuff you don't, you know, that, oh, well, the example I gave of the people who saw the two photographs of the security right. guard, the people who were deeply invested in how brilliant they were because they had figured out this conspiracy that somehow the government had not told the people and, you know, they're way ahead of it. If their self-image is, I could not be wrong about this. I get this sort of stuff right all the time. And then they're clearly wrong. There's a photograph right in front of them. Um, that might cause them to hallucinate that they see the photo differently. So this, essentially, the rationalization of the hallucination gets us kind of back to zero. If we, if we give some in evidence in our face that says, you're so wrong about this, we have to kind of reset our expectations. We either have to change our entire identity, uh, the way that we see ourselves, or we have to go, what, those photos? That's ridiculous. That's not the same guy. And that's just an easier calculation for our brains to make. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. It's, so it's, it's the easiest thing your brain can do is to say, I was right all along, instead of you know, rework your entire history and your self-image and everything else. Let, let, me, let me tie this to something fun. Sure. Um, I know I've talked about the, uh, the idea that we're a simulated universe and that some creatures built us to believe we're real. Mm -hmm. The idea here, and by the way, there are credible people for, for your listeners who believe this. Yeah, I know. think Elon Musk is one of them. Am I wrong about that? I, I believe thing? I heard that, yeah. yeah. So, so it's not a, there are scientific and, uh, scientists and philosophers who, who think this is worth a look. And the idea is that this, as soon as one species is smart enough to create a simulation that also thinks it's real, they'll probably make more than one. And they might make thousands of them. Maybe it's a game that kids can do. They can all make their own civilizations. So the odds are that it's very unlikely that we're an original species when there will be so many copies. So if we're a copy, then we're programmed, meaning that there's somebody who's trying to conserve resources, as all programmers do. It is unlikely that they would build a universe that had everything in it just in case somebody saw it. That would not be any way to program anything. You would, you would only do it as needed, um, but here's the fun part. You would also want to make sure that every person's experience was as, as easy to program as possible. So if you believed that we had uh, had lunch yesterday, and I believed we didn't, and we get together when we realize we have different beliefs about this, <laughs> One, one of us has to change. And it's much easier, instead of having us rewrite our history and all that and all the things it was connected to, for one of us to say, oh, now suddenly I'm spontaneously hallucinating that it was somebody who looked like you, and yeah, I got that confused. Right? But none of that might be true. In a simulated universe, the programmer is just trying to reconcile the, the, the problems without creating a permanent history that's objective. Right? So this is kind of like, all eight levels or eight worlds of Mario Brothers do not exist inside the TV at one time. The only thing that exists is the frames you're looking at on the screen while you're playing. And if somebody else is playing Mario Brothers at the exact same time, they're playing their entire, they're playing their own game. It doesn't have to reconcile with whatever you're doing at home in your living room with whatever they're doing home, at home in their living room. Well, bringing that to the human example, um, yeah, there are people who believe they're living in a country where a, a Hitler-like person has taken over and you know everything's going to go to hell soon. And there are people who think, oh, we're on the, the cusp of a golden age. The stock market's up. Those are completely different movies. Um, and, and the fascinating thing is that until something violates one of them, you know, until somebody sees something that you just can't explain away, the program doesn't need to reconcile them. We can just both live and procreate and you know, and there was never any reason that we needed to reconcile them. How do we spot cognitive dissonance and then maybe short circuit it? Is it possible? I think the best you can do is to figure out who got triggered, uh, at least more likely got triggered. So if, I, if you'll allow me to use the election example, people who supported Trump uh, were optimistic he would get elected. They knew lots of people who voted for him. So when he got elected, there was nothing necessarily that I can see that would have triggered any kind of cognitive dissonance. But if you were positive this monster could never be elected, and then he was, you have to rewrite your whole idea of the world you're living in. So it is far more likely that if, if uh, members of those two groups disagree, it's more likely that the one who has an obvious trigger 
for cognitive dissonance is the one in it. That doesn't guarantee it, because I suppose you could also be invisible to your own trigger, right? You know, the whole, whole point of cognitive dissonance is that when you're in it, you can't see it. But maybe, and this is really speculation on my part, maybe you could find the trigger and say, well, in this case, I had a trigger or the other person had a trigger, and that might be, give you a, a hint. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I thought for sure this is going to be a, a trouncing of the nth degree, and then when it, that didn't happen, I remember waking up and going, I clearly live in a bubble where only, <laughs> I only see people who have similar opinions to me. I need to fix that because this was so wildly wrong. I really thought it was going to be like, over before I even felt tight, you know, the, the whole long evening, right? I thought, I'm gonna be in bed as soon as I'm done with dinner because it's not even gonna be close and we're gonna wake up with what we all thought was gonna happen. Now, it was based on your earlier comment, the fact that you were not um, strongly uh, aligned with any particular group allowed you to, to uh, reinterpret your situation fairly rationally. Mm. I mean, what you just said sounds totally rational to me. It's like, oh, I just realized I was in a bubble. Yeah, I just, uh, I just went, holy California, right. I gotta travel more or something. But you realize that, you know, 40% of the country said, Russia, right. <laughs> you yeah. know, it had to be Russia, or there are way more racist than we ever imagined. You know, so everybody came up with their own story about why they were wrong. Yeah, the racism thing made me quite sad because it, it sort of, there were a lot of people that said anybody who voted for this person is racist, and I just thought, like, Whoa, I don't know if we want to run headlong yeah. down that track just yet. That seems pretty, it's a, maybe I'm delusional again, but I really don't want to think those types of negative things about the country that we live in. I don't want to bury my head in the sand if those things are true, but I also don't want to assume that people with different political beliefs are stupid or racist or uh, really want to see the world burn. Uh, although some of my friends who, who voted for both uh, either party were certainly in that camp too. Uh, I don't want to always assume the worst about somebody who disagrees with me because I think that is a toxic mindset to have. <laughs> yeah, and uh, both sides do in fact, assume the worst. Mm -hmm. I think Republicans think that uh, you know the, the the people on the left are just crazy or selfish, and the left thinks they're a bunch of racists and science deniers. And I'm sure that's true of the extremes on both sure. groups, but it certainly misses you know 85% of both groups. In Win Bigley, you have some tells that you talk about with rationalizations, things like looking at cognitive dissonance and saying, "All right." If we have a certain rationalization that is just beyond absurd, that's a tell. And there, there was also uh, different tells, the variety of tells that people have were also good indicators. Can you flesh that out for us? <clears throat> yeah, the, my favorite one is on Twitter, you'll see somebody uh, start the sentence with, you know, so, and then they'll misinterpret what you said as a, uh, what I call a, a, you know, a, a crazy absolute, you know? It's a, an absurd absolute. So if you say, uh, for example, I, I'm in favor of, uh, you know, guns. Mm -hmm. Then somebody will say, so you're in favor of giving a toddler a loaded gun in a crib. Great, you idiot. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, how could anybody have interpreted that as giving, you know, to that extreme absurd absolute? But the person, I used to think that the person who would say such a thing is just a bad debater. Right, they just have logical fallacies they can't quite get a yeah, grab they're, on. Yeah, they're, they're just saying whatever they need to say because that's the other side. But I, I now see that as they, they hit cognitive dissonance because whatever I said must have erased all of their good reasons. They <laughs> actually had to, in, they had to reinterpret what I said until it didn't make sense so they could still be right. Uh, and when you watch somebody reinterpret what you say as a, an extreme, absolute, it's like every time. So look for words like, uh, every time, oh, are you saying every time this happens? Are you saying that not one single time you've ever seen this? As soon as you see that, you know that uh, they've accepted your argument, but you know, at least it makes sense to them, but they can't live in that world, so they've got to rewrite their, rewrite their personal history. That sounds like me arguing with my wife. <laughs> I know she's right, so I have to think of the most extreme situation in which she would be wrong, and that's the one I'm going to bring up in the car on the way here. Yeah, she's very familiar with that. Jen, you know all about that. Yes. Yes, she knows all about that. One of the tells that someone is engaged or indulging in cognitive dissonance was that there are Oh, one multiple. person explains it this way, and another person ah, okay. explains it that way, and there's a hundred different explanations, and they all kind of yeah. lead to the one conclusion. Right, so right after the election, CNN published uh, 
some long list of all the different reasons that uh, people got it wrong and, and Trump actually won. And they're all different. And, uh, you know, if you see that many different reasons for something, um, it means that nobody knows the reason, which means that maybe they don't want to accept the reason. <laughs> you know, uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a red flag when you see lots of different explanations and everybody's looking at the same data. That's, that's the thing. If everybody were looking at different information, then different explanations make sense. But if they're looking at the same stuff and they have the same brains and they've got 24 different reasons to explain it, probably none of them are right. But can't there be multiple explanations for the same phenomenon or for the same result? Well, there are multiple variables. So you could have a situation where um, you know lots of things were 2% of the, of the answer. Sure. But when you're trying to sell it as the reason, you know, it would be reasonable to say, okay, well, there were a whole bunch of things and maybe this was 2% and this was 1%. Had somebody said that, I would say, oh, that's a, a reasonable person who is not in cognitive dissonance at all. But when you, gotcha. look, when you look into it and there are so many different things and you say, well, the reason is sexism. Right. Yeah. Hillary ran a bad campaign and sexism and racism. Those could all be right, though, right? Well, they could all be 1%, right. 2% of the problem, you know, and they're all complicated because it could work both ways in some cases. And, you know, yeah. So if anybody says the complicated version, like, well, there are many variables, we can't suss it out. What I said was that persuasion would be a better predictor and that it did, in fact, predict a number of things along the way as well as the final result. But I still present that with um, all the humility that I can muster as what I call a filter. That is to say, it seems to, be, seems to me that we don't really have a good sense of reality. Nobody does. You know, we mm -hmm. all have movies in our heads that are, are our personal reality. So the experiment was, if you pick this variable, does it help you predict better than other filters on the world? So it doesn't mean it's true. Um, doesn't mean there's even an objective reality necessarily. But we can observe because I predicted publicly and I said, I predict this and then you can see if it was true and, and they were good predictions. Right, because there's a lot of folks out there that go, all right, guy gets lucky predicting a Trump win. Now I got a friggin' book in front of me. Come on, <laughs> man, you're giving yourself too much credit. And it sounds like what you're saying is maybe we'll never know. I, I always make fun of the fact that uh, you know somebody becomes a millionaire, they start a company, everything goes right, and then they, the first thing they do is write a book. It's like, hey, uh, well, everything I did must be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's just no logic to that. Some people were going to succeed. You know, it was a thousand variables. Every one of them had to line up to make this happen. Um, so uh, you, you should be cautious of someone who writes a book and said, I succeeded, and therefore you should do it this way. So I try to write books that say, um, here's a process, you can try it yourself, it doesn't cost you anything, compare it to what you were doing, make your own decision. This is, uh, is that called survivorship bias? Is that the fallacy that, that is involved with that? I always mix these things up. I think that's what it is, and, and what I mean by that is, an example that I see all the time is when we go to these entrepreneur events. Right now we're at the NASDAQ Entrepreneur Center, and there's a lot of events here, and sometimes you'll hear someone say, you know, I'd like to think the talks here are better, but sometimes you'll hear entrepreneurs say things like, you know, just follow your passion. But the problem is when Mark Cuban or somebody says something like that, he can say that and we see it because he's on Shark Tank. There's a lot of other people who believe the same thing and they live in the basement on their mom's couch because that's not good advice, but it sounds really good and it certainly sounds better than be in the right place at the right time, work really hard, here's how you manage a team of talented employees, here's how you recruit those employees, here's how you outsource manufacturing to China in a cost-effective way. No, 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 screw that, follow your dreams. Where's my check? Yeah, and then nobody wants to admit that luck is a gigantic factor. So the way I dealt with luck in my own career is I tried lots and lots of stuff and I waited for something to catch on. Mm -hmm. But you never know which one, in advance, you never really know which one's gonna work. I think uh, we, we had somebody on the show in the past, and Jason, you're going to have to look this up, and uh, maybe we'll have to record a, a make good, but he talked about the role of luck and how when he was doing studies of entrepreneurs and things like that, we all minimize the role that luck plays in anything that actually gives us an advantage, because as a culture, we don't look at things that are considered lucky and say, this is a good thing to have on my side, because we don't believe in magic and things like that. It's a very Western concept. 
Whereas if we do look at luck and we go, wow, I am so lucky that I started this podcast and that I learned good work ethic from my father and I stuck with it and then I got laid off from my law job, that was actually lucky. And then I kept doing this and now I'm in this great place and interviewing all these great writers and things like that. Uh, that looks like luck if you really examine all these right things that fell into place. But it's much nicer for me, my ego, to say, Actually, you know, I just uh, had a really good vision and I stuck to it because I'm very tenacious and I'm a hard worker and all these other things happened to me, but I persevered anyway. And no, luck, of course not. I had all, I earned all of this. Right? <laughs> there, there's, there's also a weird connection between perceived luck and your attitude. So there actually uh, were studies, Dr. Richard Wiseman studied whether people had luck. And uh, he found that you, could, you can fake luck meaning that if you say to yourself, I'm lucky, something good's gonna happen, it turns out it changes um, your perceptual abilities. It, it sets your filter differently. So if you expect luck, even if you're just talking yourself into it, you're more likely to notice something or even maybe do something a little bit differently. So you're, it's sort of a way of programming yourself to notice luck that was going to happen no matter what. You just wouldn't have noticed before. What is, is that called the reticular activation system? Or yes, something yes. Like that? That, that's one of the names for it, yeah. Right, yeah. It's your ability to, for example, pick out your name in a crowd when all everything else is just crowd noise. Yeah, when, once you set your focus on something, you just start noticing those things which matter to that focus, and uh, that's fairly well documented. Why do you hate analogies so much? I use analogies all the time on the show to teach and illustrate concepts, and I'll often get an email. Scott Adams says that analogies, if you use those, you've already lost. The, the, probably nothing is more misunderstood than my view of analogies. So let me, let me see if I can, for the first time ever, clearly explain what I mean. Analogies for explaining a new concept are excellent. Oh, good. So, so I'm not saying analogies are bad all the time. I'm saying that nobody ever won in an argument with an analogy. So nobody ever said, well, you've got a mustache, Hitler had a mustache, apparently you're going to invade Poland. <laughs> All right? So that's the sort of way people try to win an argument with an analogy. But if you're trying to say, you know, if you're trying to describe a zebra to someone who'd never seen it, you'd say, well, it's like a horse. Imagine you painted some stripes on it, and it would get you there faster. So analogies, excellent way to describe a new concept. but you're never going to win an argument with an analogy. Because you're arguing about something that is that you've set up that isn't what you're actually arguing about? Well, you, every analogy gives the opponent infinite ammunition to attack because the analogy is imperfect by its design. That's what an analogy is. It's not the thing. It's, th it's something that just has something in common with the thing. Right, something analogous, mm -hmm. if you will. So, yeah, right. so, so you know that the, your opponent, who is not going to be swayed at all, is going to say, well, look at all the problems with that analogy, A, B, C, it's completely different because of this. You can never get to the end of that path, uh, so analogies are useless. There's so much in Win Bigly that has to do with persuasion and things like the power of slogans, the power of color association, the power of contrast. I'd like to wrap with the concept of strategic ambiguity. Because as soon as I heard that, I went, oh my God, I think I see this all the time and I think I use this all the time and never knew what that was called. Can we talk about why this is so effective? Well, first of all, what is it and why is it so effective? So strategic ambiguity, the way, way I use it in this context, is when you um, present, let, let's say a politician says, I want to do this or that. It's, it's stated in a way that everybody gets to hear what they wanted to hear. So, for example, when, um, well, we don't want to use Trump examples, but any, any we can We can use it. I just don't want people to go, this is all BS because we're talking about somebody I don't like, because then the whole thing is lost. But I think Trump's examples are perfect for this because he's the one using it, and it's what the book is about. So um, there, there are people who think that he uh, is super tough on uh, immigration because he's a racist. So in other words, they are racist themselves, and, there's, and they probably think, hey, this is great. We found one of our own. Mm -hmm. But there are people who are not racist, just regular Republicans, who don't see anything like that. They just say um, border control is just normal business for protecting the country. So their, their frame is completely different. But both of them can see, in the way that the president talks, their own message. Now, some are going to call that the, the secret uh, racist uh, dog whistle. <laughs> but I, but uh, but I would say that the secret whistle is, is present anytime there's ambiguity. Anytime there's any lack of clarity, 
people are putting their own interpretation on it. If, they, if it happens to be a topic of racism, then people hear the magic whistle. If it's some other topic, then they just get a different opinion about what the person said. But since we're, we're kind of locked into our previous opinions of the world, <laughs> any ambiguity lets you see whatever you want to see. So basically our mind fills in the blanks, and if we're strategic about our ambiguity, we're doing we're saying or doing something deliberately so that other people's minds will fill in the blanks. Yeah, take my example of writing about um, President Trump's persuasion but not backing him on policies. So that, that's ambiguous because people don't expect you to say anything positive about the side you're not on, even if you're talking about a narrow part of that, right? It just doesn't fit with people's idea that you need to be on the left or the right. So it gives people on the left a reason to like me, because I say I'm left of Bernie, uh, you know, it, but only with practical plans. And people say, oh, I'm left of Bernie too, so I can like him. But other people can say, oh, you wrote about this guy I don't like, so I hate him. So I've <laughs> created this strategic, well, I've created ambiguity. It wasn't strategic in this <laughs> yeah, case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe a little too late. <laughs> um, but it does allow me a little wiggle room. So if somebody says, my God, you've aligned with, with this monster, I can say, read everything I've said. My policies are completely, policy preferences are completely different. So I, I, I have at least that ambiguity working for me. Scott, is there anything else that you want to communicate to the AOC audience? I know we've gone an hour and change now, and I want to make sure that we're respectful of your time. Well, um, you know, whenever I'm asked that question, I immediately go blank. That's like the go blank. Yeah, that's the, the idea. The go blank. Strategic <laughs> blanket, blank of beauty. Uh, but, it, but if I were to, let me summarize some of what I call the, the strongest techniques. All right, we talk about, talked about making people think past the sale. That's a strongish technique, but it's not like a, the strongest. Mm -hmm. um, among the strongest would be contrast, right? Uh, the ability to set up, you know, this thing is horrible and this thing is great. And that's something you see the best politicians do. They don't just say, hey, you know, we can improve. My idea is good. That doesn't create contrast. You want to say, Obamacare is the worst thing in the world. It's falling apart. Everybody's going to die. And I've got this plan. That's the best thing in the world. It's going to give everybody health. So uh, if we can abstract from the politics and, and the, the, the facts, <laughs> persuasion-wise, the greater the contrast, the, the better you can, you can make the, the, the persuasion. How is that different from just hyperbole? Because it sounds like just hyperbole, this is the best and this is terrible. How is the power of contrast different? Of course, it seems like hyperbole fits into a, a larger circle that is... Yeah, in this case, you're using hyperbole to create the, the, contrast. the contrast. Yeah. Is there another way that we could do this that, that might seem maybe a little bit less uh, right on the nose? I mean, I think everyone knows that we can just exaggerate in two different directions. Yeah, well, let, let me give you a kind of an easy, easy one. If you want, let's say you wanted to uh, attract a mate and you, you, know, you weren't using just online dating, which I suppose everybody would just do now. <laughs> but if you put yourself in a situation where there's something that you can do well compared to the other people, then people are gonna say, oh, in this narrow field of whatever we're doing here, it's a sport or whatever it is, this one person is good. So that kind of contrast makes you look like you're genetically advantaged in some way. You know, at least you're good at this one thing. And that just triggers people automatically to say, oh, I guess I need to mate with somebody who's got good genes to do this thing. That's why I started podcasting, right, Jen? Worked. <laughs> that, get, get really good at something super nerdy like podcasting, and all the ladies will come. Well, that was good until I showed up, and then yeah. your contrast went to hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For the record, that... Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's not true. But it totally makes sense, right, that somebody who's really good at dancing would maybe do better in a mating scenario where dancing is involved. Well, but for the contrast, you don't want that person who's a dancer to go where all the good dancers are. So you have to go to the dance club where everyone else stands on the wall, and you're the one that's down yes. on the dance floor. Uh, I, have, I have a friend who shall remain nameless. Uh, he's he's fairly, uh, fairly well known. But he took up uh, dancing, like a, a really like high level of dancing, the kind of where you go to the club and, and people form a circle because mm. they go, oh my goodness, this is somebody who's like semi-professional or something. So he actually bought, you know, he, he hired dancing coaches and everything. So when he goes to the club, the contrast between what he's doing and what everyone else is doing is so uh, shocking that you know he becomes everybody's friend and you know it's this amazing social experience and he did it through entirely the power of contrast 
Scott, thank you so much. The book Win Bigly out October 31st. So by the time you listen to this, you can go and buy it. And you will never look at television the same way because you can look at these examples and look, if you're anti-Trump or you're super pro-Trump, this will be interesting to you for different reasons, I would imagine, but it will cause you to look at behavior differently. And I think that's the win. I think that's the big win from the book. I hope it changes how people see their, the, the universe itself. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.